Hey, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Fernie. I'm the pastor at Mid City Church, and we are so glad that you all are worshiping with us. Whether it's on your couch, on your kitchen uh, table, wherever you are, we're just so thankful that you're worshiping. I hope that uh, tonight as we gather, you may feel God's presence as uh, you stare at the screen, as you worship with your uh, maybe friends or family, maybe they're there with you, or maybe you're worshiping with people uh, from different places. I got a text message last week from somebody who got to watch the live stream with her parents, and that was just such a powerful thing because they were not in the same place as far as I know. And so just an opportunity to worship together, even though we don't get to be physically present with one another. I just want to give you a couple of announcements before we begin begin worship. So first of all, uh, we have on, on, you'll see a link on the top of this video. There is a a connect card. We want to know who was worshiping with us tonight. So if you can take a moment to click on that, fill out the connect card. We'd love to, to know who was worshiping with us. The second thing is a prayer card. So it'll give you a link and uh, you can fill out a prayer request and I, I'm checking that list every day and I wanna be able to pray with you. Uh, I posted on my Facebook page a couple weeks ago or last week, the days are running uh, mixed up in my head. But I posted about how I've been praying every morning and I wanna be able to pray for you and for your, for your requests and not just pray randomly for you. Even though I know that God hears all of our prayers, I wanna be able to pray for you by name. So. Take a moment, fill out one of those prayer cards. I want to pray with you. The third one is a giving option. So I know right now times are uncertain for everybody, but uh, at Mid-City Church, we believe uh, giving is an opportunity for us to practice generosity. It's a spiritual discipline. And so I want to invite you into that. If you are able to give a dollar, if you're able to give uh, whatever God is calling you to give, I want to invite you um, to, for all of us to practice the spirit of generosity. So there's a couple ways that you can give. Uh, there is, and you'll see a picture of this too, but uh, you can go to midcity.church and click on the link to give, and that'll be an option. You can also text FUMCBR to 22525. FUMC is our, our main campus. And then you can also mail a check to our main campus address, which is 930 North Boulevard, uh, Baton Rouge, 70802. So uh, I just want to invite you into that practice with us. The last thing I want to do, and you'll hear me say this every single week as long as we gather online, uh, I want to really invite you to engage with worship. I know it's really easy to just kind of turn it on and uh, have worship in the background, maybe stream it while you're doing other stuff. Uh, I want to invite you to, to be intentional these next uh, 30 minutes or so and, and, and worship, be present in God's presence and uh, soak in what God is speaking to you and nudging uh, in you, whether it be through music, through scripture, through prayer, through word. I believe that God is present. Uh, You know, this is not how we planned to worship. We planned to worship in person. And it's so easy, in my opinion, to feel God's presence when the body of, uh, uh, when people are gathered together singing praises to God. Uh, the, The worship team feeds off of that. As a preacher, I feed off of that. There is something beautiful about us gathering in the same room. But I believe even now, as we worship through a camera, through a screen, and uh, in separate rooms, in separate places, sometimes even at different times, God is still in the midst of that. And so I want to invite you to open your hearts to what God is doing and to be open and to be fully engaged in this worship experience. Oh, that's that. Why don't we go to God in prayer as we begin our worship? Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. And God, we put our trust in you because we know that, God, there is no better place to put our trust in than in you. So God, tonight we lift up every joy, every concern. We lift it up to you and we trust you with it. God, take away any anxiety, any fear, any worries. I pray that if at least for these next 30 minutes, I pray that we may be uh, fully surrounded with your peace and your love and your assurance. May we cast all other things aside, God. God, move in this place, speak to us, lead us, nudge us. God, and we just give you thanks. Amen. Amen. tonight to worship our God. So where you're at right now, let's start singing this. Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. 
we turn to you. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Hope is stirring. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. Amen. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Sing out, Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Welcome. 
the life you gave. Your body was broken, your love poured out. You bled and you died for me there on the cross. You can breathe your last as you were crucified. You gave it all for me. white 
right now we thank you for the cross we thank you for your life that was given God your perfect life Jesus you set the perfect example for us God as believers Lord we can only strive each and every day to continue to seek after you and follow your direction God and strive to live a life as you lived. And we know that we can't do that by ourselves. That we know we need you, God, now more than ever. Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for your amazing grace, God. Spirit, we thank you for being present here right now, filling us up during this time. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you just continue to move in this place as Fernie brings your message, your word, God. I pray that that word would soak into our hearts, into our lives. Lord, that you would open our ears to hear exactly what you have for us tonight, to open our hearts ready to receive it, to believe it, and to share it, God. Continue to transform us. Make us more and more like you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. It's in your name that we pray. So uh, I moved to Baton Rouge five years ago, and the first thing that I was told was that it was a great city to live in. There's a lot of football, a lot of crawfish, but traffic is horrible. And I, you have to know this about me. I lived in Chicago before I lived here, and the idea of bad traffic in Baton Rouge, a city of about 250,000 compared to a city of 2 million people, a little over or more than 2 million that just didn't make sense to me. I could not fathom that. So I just kind of blew that off. There is no possible way traffic is worse in Baton Rouge than it is in Chicago. But I've got to tell you, boy, was I wrong. Traffic in Baton Rouge is absolutely horrible. And and I, I maybe it's the Texas inside of me. I'm sorry. But I just think even a lot of drivers in Baton Rouge are pretty bad. And, but here's the thing. Before you think I'm judging you, I now have a Baton Rouge driver's license, and I know that the things that annoyed me are things that I do now. So I'm talking about myself now. Uh, not so I'm, It's not just the others. It's me, too. I am one of those bad drivers. But ever since I got to Baton Rouge, I developed road rage. I had no idea what road rage was before I moved to Baton Rouge. I had no clue why cars really needed a horn, and I didn't even realize people didn't use their blinker until I moved here. But I developed road rage, and let me tell you what my road rage consists of. So first, I become very dramatic. So let me give you an example. Let's pretend, I don't think everybody in the room is laughing right now. Let's pretend that uh, you're driving and the car in front of you is about to turn right into a parking lot and they slow down very much. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen that driver who's about to go into a parking lot and they slow down. They almost come to a complete stop before driving into that parking lot. Every single person in this room is shaking their heads because they've all seen that. The, the thing that makes that worse is when that person slows down so much and they don't have a blinker on. That just messes with me. So when that happens, my road rage kicks in. So let's imagine this is an imaginary uh, situation. 
that happens, the first thing I do with my road rage is I become very dramatic. I pretend that I don't have enough time to brake. I like hold onto the steering wheel with both hands. I tense up. Sometimes if I have extra time, I like grab the seat next to me, like if it's gonna fly out the window or something. I become very, very dramatic. So that's part one of my road rage. Part two is the shaking of my head. So as soon as everything is calm, I just stare at the car and I shake my head. And I make it very aware that what they did was wrong. <laughs> Sometimes, I will be honest, I turn to look at the car and just stare at it as I drive by. But that's my second thing. I just, I just shake my head. I don't close my eyes, but I shake my head, making sure people know that what they did was wrong. And the, the, the third thing I do um, is that I begin to tell this imaginary passenger in my car everything that that car did wrong. So in that situation, right, I would be really dramatic. I'd hold on to the seat. I would, I would be very dramatic. I would shake my head, and then i say, now, that person could have caused a really big accident because you shouldn't slow down that much, and you should always have your blinker, and why do they have to stop so long to turn? Like, I would give this whole commentary as to what that person did wrong. That's what my road, road rage consists of, and I'll tell you, my wife has seen that side of me many, many times. And I will be honest, it didn't uh, really, that side of me did not exist until I moved to Baton Rouge. I don't know why, but I'm sure that I caused that same type of um, frustration in other people now that I've lived here long enough. So uh, not too long ago, I was in the car with one of my friends, and we were driving down Government Street, and a car pulled out in front of us. And I uh, normally would have done those three things, but because my friend was with me in my truck, can you imagine what I did? I did nothing. I simply slowed down, kept a smile on my face, and once that car kept going, I went about my business. And my friend looked at me and he said, wow, you, you were very composed there. I probably would have been going off on that guy. And I was like, eh, what can you do? Just keep on driving, right? And so it was really interesting to me that in that moment, my typical road rage, those three things that I would have done, didn't happen because my friend was with me in that car. It's interesting how all of us behave a little differently when we realize that people are watching us. It's interesting how we all act a little differently when there's other people around us who are watching what we're doing. And I get it. It's not a judgment. It's not, uh, I'm not talking down on anybody. I'm even speaking to myself. We all act a little bit differently when we know people are watching us. I, I, I don't like to lose my temper in public because what if people think that I uh, am always grumpy and always angry? I'll tell you another thing. Uh, during this season of social distancing, I have been binge watching the, the Tiger King every night. And yeah, and it's, 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 a, it's a show. Um, <laughs> but I've been watching that. And then today I started watching uh, Doomsday Preppers. Right? I don't share that with people very often because if they saw me doing that, they might think I'm lazy because I'm just watching these TV shows, right? I'll, I'll give you another example. I love to play basketball. I shared a basketball story with you last week. I love to play basketball. And when it's just me, when I'm the only person playing, I still pretend, I'm, 30 some, I'm 31 years old. I still pretend to be Kobe Bryant sometimes, shooting that last second buzzer beater to win the NBA finals. Like a 30 something year old should not be doing this, right? But I share this with you because like, when we are around people, there are certain things we don't do. There are certain ways that we don't act that being around people seems to have an effect on the way we act, on the way we behave, on the way we respond to things all around us. You see, our actions, our beliefs, our decisions are all affected when people are watching. So I think back about my friend in that when we were in my truck, we were driving down Government Street, and how I didn't uh, respond like I normally would have. And I know that he noticed that I didn't respond the way I normally would have. And I wonder if maybe next time he's driving and somebody cuts him off, if, if anybody would say to him, uh, if next time somebody cuts him off, if he would think to himself, man, I, I can either blow up right now or I can do what Fernie did. I can stay calm. I can go about my business. I can, I can be thankful that we didn't get in a car accident. I can either blow up or I can do as I've seen other people do. 
You see, what I've realized as I keep thinking about that story is that what we do when others are watching affects what others do when no one is watching. I'm going to say that one more time. What we do when others are watching affects what others do when no one is watching. Does that make sense? What, what, when, when people watch us do stuff and, and they see that they're, all, they're nudged by how we should respond and how we should act towards certain things, and it, it, and it can make an impact in people in such a way that when they're on their own in those same situations, they begin to respond differently. Maybe they begin to follow us and, and, and be a little bit different in the way they respond. I'm going to say that line one more, one more time. What we do when others are watching can impact what others do when no one is watching. This weekend, we begin Holy Week. And Holy Week is a very important uh, week uh, season in the life of the church. It begins with Palm Sunday. Then we jump over, well, Palm Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And then we jump to Maundy Thursday, and that's the day we remember Jesus uh, breaking bread with the disciples, him washing his, their feet, and uh, spending time in the garden praying and ultimately getting arrested. Then we go to Good Friday, which is the day that Jesus is crucified and dies. And then we jump to Easter, that Sunday, when we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' win uh, over sin and death his victory over sin and death. And so Holy Week is a very important season in the life of the church. And so I'm going to do a shameless plug right here. Uh, I want to invite you to be a part of our Holy Week services. So next Thursday, we're going to gather at the same time, and we're going to celebrate uh, Maundy Thursday. Next Friday, we will have a service also at 7 o'clock, the same place, and that'll be our Good Friday service. And then Easter morning, we will have a sunrise service at 7.15 a.m., And so I want to invite you to journey through Holy Week with us and and all of those services. But let's get back to the story. So so this Sunday is Palm Sunday. And because we won't be gathering on Sunday, we're going to celebrate Palm Sunday a little bit earlier. So we're going to celebrate it today. And let me just give you some background. So Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And it's it's a day of rejoicing for a lot of people. When you read the story, um, it comes from Matthew 21, but when you read the story, uh, you see that people are so excited. People line up as Jesus begins to walk into the city, and it tells us people take their cloaks off and they lay it on the ground. Some wave branches, others lay branches on the ground for for Jesus to to travel on as he goes into the city. And as Jesus is getting closer and closer to the city, the, the, the crowds begin to shout, Hosanna! And in fact, the the exact words is, uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds are so excited that Jesus is coming, that he is entering the city. Because, you see, you have to understand, uh, the Jewish people, the, the, the Israelites, they were in a place that they did not expect to be in. Life had been turned upside down for them. Life was not the way it was supposed to be. You see, the Romans were in control, not them. This city that is so sacred to them was under someone else's rule, and they couldn't do life the way that they would want to freely. They were under this foreign rule, and it was, life wasn't the way they had planned it to be. And here comes Jesus, and Jesus is supposed to, in their mind, defeat this Roman Empire and and, and make the world be just the way it was supposed to be. He's supposed to make things right. And so as he's entering into Jerusalem, what they're proclaiming is, here is Jesus, he the one who is going to save us. In fact, they yell, Hosanna, They, they shout, Hosanna, which means, save us now. Jesus entering into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday meant that their victory was finally going to happen, that life was going to go back to the way it was supposed to be. I don't know about you, but I can relate to that so well. This is not where I plan to be tonight. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. Wherever you are watching this, this is probably where, not where you plan to be tonight. Our lives have had to shift. We've all had to make adjustments. This is not 
the way we planned life to be. And when I think about this Palm Sunday reading and the Israelites shouting, Hosanna, God save us. I relate to that so well because in the midst of this uh, season of social distancing, I find myself saying quite often, God, save us. God, make this go away. God, make that number of people who are dying go down. Make the number of those who are testing positive go down. God, help us get back to work and back to our normal routines. God, this isn't the way life is supposed to be, God. Hosanna, God, save us. I can relate to them oh so well. Now, there's something interesting to this story, something I hadn't caught until this week, and I'd read it a million times, but for some reason it didn't stand out in my head until this time. And so this comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 14 through 17, and this is what it says. The blind and the lame came to him in their temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and he heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? He left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. There's something really fascinating here that I hadn't caught before, and I hope uh, to point it out to you. So, So the Pharisees are starting to get really mad. At this point, Jesus has gone into the temple, and he's overturned tables and kicked people out of the temple. He has healed people, and now children are running around the temple screaming, Hosanna. And as I was reading this, preparing for today's sermon, I started wondering, where did these kids catch that Hosanna? Who taught them to say this? Where did they find it? And it got me thinking, surely, go with me for a second, surely earlier that day, maybe some of them saw their parents, their neighbors, the vendors from down the street, people in their community standing by the gate shouting Hosanna. Maybe some of them heard somebody that they look up to shouting, Hosanna, that in the midst of a season when life made no sense, when life was not the way it was supposed to be, somebody was shouting Hosanna, and it made such an impact in their lives that they too started shouting, Hosanna. Remember what I said earlier, what we do when others are watching can impact what others do when nobody is watching. You see, I think those kids were watching from a distance as Jesus was walking into Jerusalem. And I can't help but wonder how many of those uh, adults who were out there greeting Jesus made an impact on all those kids who were watching from a distance, whose lives also didn't make sense, who had been told stories of better days, of ways things should have been, and now found hope as they shouted, Hosanna. I don't know about you, but COVID-19, social distancing, all of this has really uh, messed with me. You know, I really long to go out to dinner with friends and have one of those really long tables where you can't hear each other because you're so far away and the restaurant is so loud. But to just be there and look down the table and see my friends there. I long to go to Bruaha or City Roots and to grab my favorite coffee and just read my Bible. I miss my Tuesday morning breakfast at Simple Joe with our guys group, talking about life, waking up way too early. <laughs> I miss Mid City Makers Market. I miss all the festivals that we should have had. I miss going to places like Circa. I miss the dreams that we had for worship at Bernard Terrace. I miss, there was a week when I went to uh, La Coretta like four times in one week for our, uh, we had a Mid-City gathering. We had a Bernard Terrace Civic Association meeting. I mean, I was there four times in one week. I even miss that. (laughs) 
And to be honest, personally, my mental health has been struggling. There are days when my anxiety is so high, when my depression just feels like it's starting to boil up. There's days I just want to go drive and see my sister, my family. Life is not the way it was meant, it was supposed to be. This is not the way God intends for us to live life. This is not the way things are supposed to be. But the question is, how am I going to respond to it? Am I going to journey through life defeated, thinking, well, this is just life, I guess? Or am I going to journey through life knowing that God is bigger than all this, that God can get us through this, that, that God already has a victory for us? Can I journey through life knowing that, that when I shout Hosanna, God save us, that God will save us and get us through this? Can I trust that? And can I live life that way? You see, we have to. As Christians, we have to live life that way because others are watching. And if we can go about life saying, Hosanna, God save us. God can save us. God will save us. God has saved us. If we can go around life proclaiming that we have a victory, others will notice. And when they feel like they don't have a victory, when they feel like God is so far away, when they feel like anxiety and depression is overcoming, when they feel like life is getting the best of them, they will remember those Christians who said, I believe God is bigger. I believe God can offer hope and grace and peace and love and mercy. See, we have to hold on to our faith because when we do, others are watching and it can make an impact in their lives when nobody is watching, when they feel all alone, for them to say, Hosanna, I believe in God too. Beloved, we need to hold on to our faith tight. And my prayer is that in doing so, others will begin to hold on to their faith tight as well. So I want to do an activity tonight. I want to invite you. Uh, I, I made a post about it um, a couple days ago. I've seen some people doing it already, but there's this company, this movement, I guess, they're called Heart Hunters. And uh, my wife actually introduced me to this, and she was introduced to it by a friend of hers who's a campus ministry director in Illinois who was introduced by somebody else. So this has been stolen like four times, so it's not my original idea. But I want to invite you to do this. What, what basically the movement is, is make some hearts out of any material. Maybe it's wrapping paper that you have left over from Christmas. Maybe it's uh, a gift bag. Maybe it's just, uh, I, I don't know, uh, um, sticky notes, whatever it may be. Get some paper, make some hearts, and put them on your windows. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know about your neighborhood, but in mine, there's been a lot of people who have been walking around lately. And my prayer is that when we put those hearts on our wall, on our windows, people will see those and be reminded of God's love, of God's grace, of God's peace. May that be, my prayer is that as we put hearts on our windows, that it will be our way of shouting, Hosanna. God saves us. God loves us. God is bigger than all this. That in the midst of a season when life is not the way it's supposed to be, we still trust God. So I'm going to invite you to put those hearts on your window, uh, take pictures of them, share them on social media, encourage others to do the same. And who knows, maybe this will begin a movement in which people look at us and say, God is real. God can save us and God can make a difference. And I want to get to know that God. Beloved, let us hold on to our faith strong. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you are so much bigger than we can even begin to imagine. God, remind us today as, as you entered into Jerusalem, as Jesus entered into Jerusalem and the crowds shouted, Hosanna, we can relate to them so well because life was not the way they planned it, they intended it to be. It's not the way it was meant to be, yet they put their trust in you. 
And God, my prayer tonight is that we may put our trust in you, even though life is not the way it's supposed to be. And God, maybe, maybe, just maybe, as we hold on to our faith, we will inspire others to hold on to theirs, to search for you in the darkness, in the struggles of life, to put their trust in you, God. God, we shout Hosanna because we never know who's watching. Just like those, that crowd made an imprint on those kids. God, may we make an imprint in the world around us an imprint that speaks of the assurance that you will get us through this. God, I give you thanks. I pray this in your most precious and most glorious name. Amen. Let's lift up his name one more time. Hosanna. Because when we see you, Cause when we see you find strength to face the day, give us strength again. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Cause when we see you find strength, declare to face the day. This day, today, cause in your presence, all our fears are they're gone. Wash away. Shout it out. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. So glad you worshiped with us tonight. I hope that we will see you next week. And I just want to give you another reminder. Uh, we're going to have uh, Holy Week services. So Thursday we will meet here for uh, Monday Thursday service at 7 o'clock. Uh, Friday we will meet again here at 7 o'clock for our Good Friday service. And then Sunday morning, 7.15 a.m., we will gather for an Easter sunrise service. And then think about this. We will have the rest of the day to celebrate Easter with your family. Uh, again, I just want to thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, and I want to give you one more reminder uh, fill out a prayer card. I want to be praying for you. We want to be praying for you, lifting you up in prayer. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as we uh, go forth from this place, I pray that we may go forth shouting Hosanna. Shouting Hosanna in the face of a world that was not meant to be this way. Yet we find ourselves here and we choose to shout Hosanna either way. Go forth in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.